So, uh, Lil Martin, uh, from Shrift, uh, talking about processes in nature and selecting equipment. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, let me start with three remarks. The first is to thank uh, Casper and Dominic Ehrenfels for recent discussions on these topics and many other people on uh, less recent discussions. Um, secondly, I'm not going to give any definition, grand theory of what theoretical equivalence is, but more look at one specific case study where I think. Um, uh, talking about theoretical equivalence helps clarify disagreements. Um, and the third thing is that uh, I would like to thank Mike for inviting me because uh, I'm a mathematician of quantities, focusing on scaling symmetries. And although we talk a lot in this small literature on uh, equivalence between symmetry related models, it's not so much about equivalence between theories. Uh, and this invitation forced me to uh, bring that in. And it made me realize that I think it's helpful in clarifying. A disagreement between two kinds of scholars, which then makes means that some of them become realists about mass and some anti realists. And I think it might help us understand why that is by talking about well, how they think about theoretical equivalence uh, in a specific context. So I haven't really come up with a good neutral way of posing this main question, but you'll, you'll get the gist. So what I'm going to look at is if you have two theories of some gravity differing just in the strength of like the strength as represented by G. Uh, Newton's constant of the, the strength of gravity. Are we then talking about two distinct theories or about two equivalent theories? Um, and at least in the context of governing laws, which I think is kind of implicit, but since there's at least one union in the room, I'll try to also understand the function. But I think we can check this out afterwards if this really is going on, but that's how I think most of us are talking about it. Um, and I think people like Casper and John T. Roberts and Ramuj uh, Kalo, and well, the scoop the case is a bit more tricky. Uh, tend to think of these as equivalents or the same theory. Um, and uh, I think that's not the case. Maybe Dave Baker also thinks that implicitly, but uh, let me not make into the thing yet. But uh, uh, just to kind of give you an overview of the, of the lay of the land. Okay. Um, so, what I'll talk about is first this debate, uh, right, the context in which I think uh, the previous question becomes uh, important. This realism versus anti realism about abstract methods. And then I said I'll talk a little bit about how a union, if I were a union, which I'm not, how you might think about it. Um, but then, so I guess the need of the talk will be uh, here, where we talk about uh, standard Newtonian gravity. Um, yes. Okay. So first, a bit about realism versus anti-realism. Um, so at the face of it, if you look at Newton's second law and the new uh, uh, Newton's law of gravity, it seems like they. Uh, the way the man on the street talks about it is that they, uh, yeah, what did it put on the man on the street? Um, as if they relate absolute magnitude. Remember, you say, of the mass of one particle, of the mass relation of two particles, but the mass of that thing of this table has a certain acceleration, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so you might think, Mefache, um, that we should be realist about absolute magnitudes. In this case, I'm going to focus on masses uh, that these exist. So by that, I mean monadic properties, right? The mass of this table, not the over and above the mass of the uh, relationship between the stable and the chair. Um, and typically, um, well, these are all qualitatively um, the same, or I should say, strictly speaking, they are best relatively discernible. Um, so if you want to ask a question, well, this mass and in this world, that mass and that world, how do you accelerate under gravity? And then typically we say they also have quiddities, non qualitative identities, let the same name. So it's like this. This mass has uh, oh, this table has a mass that's called it, um, George, and this this mass uh, this uh, object has a different mass uh, with a different quiddity. Um, so that's let's say uh, you're thinking quiddities would be built into being a realist. 
uh, by default. I mean, we can then sophisticate the data if you want, but let's just for now until otherwise, I just think that's the way to go. Um, yeah, but of course, the quantities we are looking at typically in physics, chemistry, etc., are dimensional or dimension pool, anyway, they're not dimensionless. And uh, which means they're represented by a numerical number uh, times an arbitrary unit. They so might think, oh, but aren't these just relations, typically ratios, in the skies? When we say this thing is three kilograms, isn't that really kind of that? It's, doesn't that just mean that it's sense in the three to one uh, mass ratio with this with this thing in Paris that we used to have as a sense of kilograms? Not true anymore. Well, it, it was when I started working on this stuff. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so an anti realist might say, no, no, we only need uh, mass ratios and we didn't got these things for absolute masses. Okay, so to kind of say similar thing as what I said before in different words, even if you're a realist, you have to, right, because they're all the masses are qualitatively the same, well, yeah, qualitatively the same, uh, because we can't uh, directly talk about these quiddities. Um, well, this is the case. So it's by any dimensional determinable, such as mass. If you the magnitude predicate of any particle you want to talk about, I mean, I can point at it, but if I'm calling this mic over the phone and want to talk about masses or send an email with numbers, etc., and then we have to communicate and express it in terms of how it relates to something else, it brings it to some unit or some other object, etc., right? So even if you're going to advocate realism about masses, you're not going to get around this, um, right? You always need to represent in that way, and that's uh, done in a non unique um, fashion. Um, but this, this kind of kinematic inexpressibility of, of absolute masses, that's not enough to say, okay, they don't exist, right? Because what we are after, what we want to ask is, well, are they dynamically, are they empirically uh, redundant, or do we need them? Do we need them to explain um, empirical phenomena? So the real question is then whether a mass scaling leads to an empirical difference or not. Or not. Whether if it does, then it seems like we need to be realist about absolute masses. Um, if it doesn't, then you might as well uh, shave them off with Occam's razor. And so what we don't mean uh, by this is a passive scaling and a passive transformation, which is then just a change of units. So what I'm not talking about is the numbers and the unities we use to represent absolute masses. So I'm not talking about this in the uniform scalar multiplication of this uh, number. Um, what's typically done is when we do such a passive transformation, you also change um, the value of any constant of nature, with, which also has mass dimension, in this case, Newton's constant. I mean, you don't have to do this, right? You could in principle to use some units for mass and different units for G, but typically we do this, right? But typically you're like, okay, when you change the units consistently, you multiply all the masses by alpha, and then you divide uh, your original G by alpha, and nothing changes. And okay, well, that's not surprising because we're just only changing the labels. Uh, there's obviously no empirical change. We haven't done anything in the world. Uh, so this is not when I when we're asking the question, does the mass scaling need to empirical difference? We're not talking about the passive case. Uh, we're talking about uh, the active case. If we change these masses out there in the world, if they exist, is that going to lead to a difference or not? Um, so yes, the way the realist wants to talk about it, uh, I've tried to illustrate this, um, is that the laws are mapping from a bunch of absolute magnitudes, um, right? So in the case of gravity, it's mass and other mass and a distance, and that's a bit too much to draw. So here I'm just I've left out the distance. So if you look at two particle systems, assume they all have the same distance. So this is some dimension I've not drawn here. And also for simplicity, so I just only need to draw one line because I'm lazy. We'll just talk about situations where we have uh, parts that are equally massive, uh, massive, right? So this is all the possible mass magnitudes you can have from well, zero is excluded, but always infinity. Um yeah, so this. this also represents that you have two particles with added masses, and here uh, this situation represents two particles, same distance as here, uh, with uh, heavier or more massive, larger masses, uh, let's call them uh, by their quiddity uh, masses, uh, bulk masses. And then what the law does, according to the realist, it just maps uh, and, and well, the two masses and the distances to a certain acceleration. That's what the law does, right? So the trilogy here, the law, the function from these things out there in the world to other, which are not really observable directly, to things um, out there in the world which we do observe. And so, whenever we try to talk about this on the phone or however, 
we do need to spend in terms of quantity, but these are just labels we put in between, right? So we could use kilograms, etc. Um, and then if we express this function purely G in terms of the normal uh, equations, numbers, etc. Uh, the standard G, uh, then this fixes the value for G. And if you would do a better transformation, we can do that, right? We can change the units, and then all the devastational stuff in between is going to change. But that's not going to change the, the real law, according, at least not according to the realist. It's still right. The begin point and the end point are the same. What happens in between that is human, human garbage, right? Um, so to speak. So, yeah, so what we're, um, yes, oh, well, well, sorry. That's not the bank button. Yeah. So what we're after, what we're looking at is an active mass scaling. If we uh, multiply all the masses, the things out there in the world, this is going to change uh, something if we keep everything else the same. And that's going to be an important clause. What does it mean to keep everything else the same? Um, right? So it's, again, this is the main question. If you look at two initial states different only by the scaling, everything else is the same. The fold and forward with the laws. Do we get worlds that are empirically distinct or not? And we'll see that this the answer is going to depend on how you interpret the laws and especially how you interpret Newton's constant if you're also going to keep that the same um, or not. Okay, so the realist tends to say, like, look, this is how I think of it, and this is going to show that yes, um, empirical or uh, absolute masses are dynamically relevant, they exist. Um, and the reason for them is basically that if you look, okay, you look at two particle systems, uh, certain distance apart initially, outwards velocity with a certain mass, the Pallas masses, and you ask what's going to happen. And the readers will say, well, that depends on what these masses are. We know, yeah, like that, yeah. Um, if these quite, quite small masses, quite light masses, then uh, the gravitational pool will be quite small. So yes, if you evolve time forward, there will be a little bit of a break on the velocity, but not enough, and these particles will still escape each other within finite time. And um, yeah, but now if we keep everything the same, except we have an active um, mass scaling, interpreted for now as only changing the masses, nothing else, then something else is going to happen because well, forces are, is, uh, are much stronger. And because the escape velocity and inequality or equation Depends only on M, not on mass ratios, but really on M itself. If you're going to change M and none of the other symbols in that equation, something's going to change. Right? So we see in this case, uh, well, I've shown in the set that the, uh, there's enough of a gravitational break such that these particles, they initially move apart, but eventually they collide again. So to show them uh, next to each other, right? Clearly different worlds, different in observationally distinguish these worlds. Um, and the only thing that differs, so the only thing that differs is what the the mass is right, mass ratios are the same. If you're an anti realist, they only do the mass ratios. This is weird. These were the same initial states. Somehow something uh, happens. So, okay, you should be realistic about absolute masses, supposedly. Um, just to show that this is not some kind of uh, artifact, this very artificial, idealized two particle situation, which is not the actual world. This is just because this is the only. And the, we can deal with analytically, so I can just show you this formula and you get what's going on. Uh, if you do it with more particles, you just have to do it numerically, but the same thing happens, right? So if you have three particle worlds, like the, the red one, certain niche conditions, which you can read here if you want. Uh, the red one, in this case, the particle number two and three collide first, and they might not, never even collide with particle three, but anyway, if they do, that happens later. But now if you go to a, a different a three particle, a solution which has masses that are 11 times the masses of the red solution, then what will happen is that particle one and two, the ones on the left, uh, move towards each other and collide, and eventually this particle will also. Uh, but anyway, so clearly different worlds, right? And you just scale it up. I can show you four or five particles, but I'm not going. Okay. Um, okay. So that's what the realist uh, wants. Well, the realist argument. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about how a union might uh, look at all this. Um, for this audience, I assume you have seen the Lewis slide, but kind of union is in a million times. So I'm not going to do that to you and go straight into ways of liberalizing um, standard unionism, no uh, Ramsey Lewis account, that systems account, etc. Uh, I'll start with the way Hackett uh, does it. So he says, well, in response to Newton's bucket, what we're going to do is not say, oh, we need a substantive uh, mosaic 
uh, right? Because, as Carson pointed out, it is merely the truth of Newton's laws and certain frames that privilege them, not the structure of uh, not some substance power law uh, space necessarily that does it. So basically, the idea is there. You start with a union mosaic that's purely relational, that's right? That's a Lamnitian uh, union mosaic. Uh, there are still mass of them. Um, and then what you're going to do is look at all the possible reference frames uh, you could apply to that mosaic. And then in each frame, are going to look at the best axiomatizations of the laws. And then the claim is that when you crank that whole handle, that um, basically the inertial frames and the laws come out as a package deal, right? If it's not an inertial frame, the laws are going to be more, well, less good. They're going to be less simple, et cetera. Um, and only in those laws will you get the laws, uh, only in those frames will you get the laws that you expect. So you get the frames and the laws for free. Yeah. We've moved some structure from the mosaic to the supervenient, from the supervenient base to the supervenient level. And once we know that trick, we can just keep on going because all we really need, all, all that's observable is particle trajectory. So basically, why not get rid of everything that's not a particle trajectory? Uh, to one, the next step you could make is say, okay, well, even if you think the readers have pointed out, yes, absolute mass is matter, doesn't mean that to be in the mosaic, right? We can also um, promote them or demote them. I guess, move them up a level. Um, so here again, you could say, well, uh, it's kind of uh, like from Pratsen said, uh, the absolute mass scale, maybe it's just privileged because of the truth of Newton's laws only for the choice of skill, but not because it's some fundamental thing out there in the world which exists and in virtue of which mass ratios hold. So you could again, uh, well, so until you could look at a mosaic where you, which is not only relational, but also you get rid of intrinsic absolute, or sorry, absolute masses, uh, you only uh, have mass ratios and see, okay, what happens there? And then you're gonna consider not all, only all reference frames, but also all possible choices on absolute mass scale. And then the claim is, again, you're gonna get all these things of three, the mass scale, the laws, the inertial frames, uh, this constant will also be the laws, and that you just get them all for free. Uh, and then of course you can just keep going and uh, nothing stops us. Or not much stops us. Um, so why even have these mass fundamental mass ratios in mosaic? Let's just get rid of those as well. And then the claim is you just get them all. Um, now, one thing is, of course, that you don't get them uniquely for free, right? Uh, we only have computer access to kind of g times n. You're not going to access them indirectly. Of course, we already knew at the level of just the numbers because of the right, passive scaling. You can always uh, do we change the units? But moreover, uh, if you think you find a choice of like at a supervenient level of uh, a set of absolute masses and then uh, a function that matches into accelerations, any other function, or like, yeah, you can find many more other solutions, right? This, for instance, uh, or masses that are twice as heavy, but then just take a, a function that maps twice as heavy masses to the original accelerations. And um, right, so these are all, uh, uh, you could choose any of them. Um, and so, yeah, these are going to all be empirically equivalent. So, we'll give you the same trajectories, the same um, uh, accelerations. Are these options also theoretically equivalent? Um, well, I guess, in a sense, yes, in that they all describe the same mosaic, which is the fundamental stuff that you, may, you mean is committing to. So, when it comes to the state of affairs at the fundamental level of the mosaic, yes, they are metaphysically theoretical, or they're physically equivalent. Of course, at the the supervenient um, level, the level of non-fundamental ontology, it will differ where you say, oh, there's like two added masses or two bob masses, and in each case you have uh, yeah, different uh, functions curly g. Now, uh, what I guess you could do if one were a union, which I'm not, but trying to think about what a union do, you could then say, well, I could do kind of some generalized notion of sophistication and say, I'm just gonna force that all these options are the same. Uh, stipulating it, or what you then need to do kind of uh, the metaphysical counterpart of that move that you remove the quiddities from the absolute masses, uh, right? So they all differ in terms of the quiddities, but yeah, uh, so you could uh, make the move, the sophistication move, which I guess many of you are very familiar with. Um, so I take it that that is what the union might want to say. I'm not too happy with that because at that point it kind of feels like you dissolve the original question of like, right, I want to know like. If you change this mass into this mass, is something going to change in the world? And it just seems like if you do this, then you can't really even ask that question anymore. But I guess if you're union, maybe you don't 
it's like maybe too model a question anyway, and just maybe don't care. So maybe if I were human, Jimmy and I would be totally fine with that. Um, I'll leave it up to Jimmy. Um, okay, but so let's come to um, well, the governing law interpretation. What does it look like uh, from that perspective? Um, and there, an important thing to point out is that um, which I forget whether it's Casper or Mahmoud who coined the term exclusive. I think it was you, no? Yeah, that's you. Um, where they, I mean, they all talk about it, but you coined the term. Yeah. Um, that the two senses of scaling, and that I have just been using what is then called exclusive. Um, yeah, the exclusive one, right? Where it said you multiply all the, the masses or you change them uniformly and keep everything else the same. And then it also includes. Uh, the strength of the law as represented by normal form G, uh, whereas you could also consider an inclusive scaling, um, whereas you again uniformly multiply that, um, but then also inversely scale the strength of the law uh, represented by uh, G. Um, why would you do that? I think this idea is that where you represent it, G, like normal G, has uh, the, the mass dimension is minus one. So we'd say, oh, if you scale all the masses, well, G is dimension wise, it is also a mass, but then in, in inverse mass. Uh, so you should scale that in the appropriate way. And then if you do that, then these scalings compensate each other exactly such that if you apply this inclusive scaling, um, nothing is going to change. Um, right? So uh, they would say, uh, this is the, yeah, implicitly the realist back at the start of the talk was using uh, the exclusive scaling, but that's not the correct one. We should focus on the inclusive one. Um, and you think, oh, that's weird, but then you change G, don't we don't have a different gravitational theory, but it would also end saying, no, no, that's fine. You're not changing theory. We're still looking at the same theory. Um, um, so that's all fine. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, this is the correct scaling, and this scaling will tell us that changing the masses uniformly is, after all, a symmetry of the theory. Um, yeah, okay. Um, let me just have a brief internet so because many of you will know the scoop that's work, and you might think, oh, why am I not mentioning Shimik here? Um, let me just, I mean, Shimik, I think, is definitely in the spirit of all of this because he thinks, yes, scaling on masses is not a, uh, is, sorry, is a symmetry, uh, but it's slightly, the reasons are slightly uh, different because the way he thinks about this is it's not because, oh, you need to change. G in the appropriate way to make sure that it's um, a symmetry. The way he thinks about the theory, the Newtonian gravity, there's no G whatsoever, right? So the kind of uh, anti-realism or comparativism uh, that he advocates is, we think, well, the laws, even though we write them normally as F M times A, uh, they should very directly be understood as directly only relating, talking, referring to mass or magnitude relations and not to absolute magnitudes, right? So uh, when you write F is N times A, that's really shorthand for, for this. And you could do the same thing for the gravitational law, which becomes this monster. But anyway, the point is you don't need to read it. The point is there won't be any G in here, right? We just write it out. Um, so in this case, yes, uh, you don't even need to talk about what happens to be when you scale there is no G. There are only ratios. So taking masses uniformly is not going to change ratios. So you just see straight from the law. That's not going to change. The laws don't even talk about them. Uh, there's nothing to uh, to say. So um, that's just to have a uh, shimmy covered. But let's get back to um, this issue. Uh, right, so inclusive, exclusive scalings, which one um, is the right one? Uh, well, I think exclusive one is the correct one. Um, so as I said, um, I think of, at least in the governing law, framework of laws as mapping Right, mass magnitudes and this is magnitudes, acceleration magnitudes uh, like this. And so, what this curvy T does, this is the law, I, I would say, uh, is it maps right two particles with LS masses to uh, this acceleration, uh, an escape situation, and uh, both masses, which are twice as large as the LS masses, uh, to a different empirically distinct uh, situation, right? The coincidence where they do collide or free collide to do. Coincide. Um, yeah, so then you might ask, okay, so let's consider a world where you have two Alice particles and in that world they're going to escape. Now you can ask, what happens if we would actively scale 
uh, what's going on there and um, what Casper uh, and Mahmoud and John Roberts seem to be saying is no, in that case, we still get nothing changes uh, spatially, right? We still get an escape. So what we need to do is then map the new situation, right? We had two Alice masses, now we have larger masses, but we don't get any different um, uh, acceleration. So we need to map this to there. Um, so we're basically using a different G, right? As we saw before, G maps this point to there. So what's going on here um, seems to be that if you want to still say, well, this mass scan is not going to change anything, we can still get these accelerations, still get observable behavior. Behavior. We need to here have a different um, mapping, uh, purely, purely G uh, prime. Um, and that sounds to me like cheating in that, well, we said the laws are functions and then pick one. I mean, yes, it's literally wrong, but pick one and stick with it and then change the masses without changing the function. Uh, so that's why I think the exclusive one is the way to go for, right? If you think too much about um, right the equations, the numbers, normal G, then we think, oh yeah, there is something, a mass dimension happening, we need to change it as well. But I think, again, that's, these are just labels that can be uh, misleading. If you think directly of what the law is, it maps these things out in the world, mass distances to the other things out in the world, accelerations, um, then I think we just we stick to one, change the masses, something will change. Right, so basically, as I said, to repeat, as I said before, uh, if this is what the, the this uh, purely G, the law does, then well, um, yeah, you start here, you get that behavior, then if you scale, you get different behavior. That's literally what um, purely G does. Um, so to wrap up, um, yes, the realist say there is an expressible ignorance about mass quiddities. I need to talk about them indirectly when, we, when I really want to talk about them. Uh, as a human when I want to talk about the world, but the world's not going to care. Uh, and yes, if you have um, a set of masses and one law, I could have equally, based on empirical data, we have chosen right, a different one as long as they relate in, in this way. Um, but that, um, yes, that's true. But that doesn't mean the fact that we can choose any of one, uh, right? we can choose any of these options, but we have to choose one of them. We can choose all of them. Pick one and stick with it. Um, Right, so yes, I cannot tell you that we should have chosen the picture in the past. It might well be if all we observe in the world is this, that in reality, it's not like we had the Alice and the Bob masses, but actually the masses in the world are much uh, lighter than we thought. And we have just a function like this. Yes, I can distinguish between that, um, but the argument still goes through, right? Even if this is the case, it will still be, if you take from here to here, you will get different observable behavior. So I cannot tell you whether you should choose this picture or one of the previous picture, but you have to pick one of them, I claim. And within that picture, the argument will go through that a change here will lead to a change there. So it cannot be when you look at this one, oh, use this arrow. And when you, use this, uh, when you then look at these masses, I'm like, oh, we're going to use a, a different arrow uh, until the package deal or so I claim. Um, yes, so I'd say, um, there are many you can pick from, but you need to pick one and do it consistently. Um, yes. So to, to connect this to the term theoretical equivalence, um, I think um, if you right, the laws are these functions are just showed. If you go to a different one, that's a different function, a different theory, a different law. These are uh, different theories, whereas um, the other scholars think, no, it is uh, still within the same uh, theory. Now, how much time do we have left? I mean, I could finish here, whatever the last day is being half a moon. So I could, well, I, um, I could also just skip this. There's a risk that we then have to go through it anyway, depending on the questions, but maybe that's fine. Ah, okay. Uh, I mean, this is not very long. Uh, yeah, two, three slides. Um, so that was the main point I wanted to make. Um, but you could then go on, so as a little uh, encore. I, um, what you could do is come up with a different theory. So now I've been talking about kind of the, the standard uh, version of Newtonian gravity and looking at it from a cognitive law perspective. Um, but you could also look at an other theory in, in the sense of different equations, and then things might change. So if you think if you still want to be a realist, I think there's a way to do. Uh, sorry, an anti-realist. There's a way to do it to say yes, math scans are symmetry, but I don't think 
uh, it's going to work by just saying we need to do an inclusive scaling as before. You just need a totally different theory, and then I think you can make that conclusion come out the way uh, one wants. Uh, but in that case, you really need to come up with one with a different equation. So what you do is, instead of where we normally have G, you replace it by a different constant divided by the sum of all the masses. Uh, right. So this, so where this had uh, mass dimension minus one, this will have zero mass dimension now. Um, and in that case, right, so you get a different gravitational law. And the crucial thing is what happens in the velocity inequality. In the velocity inequality, uh, that's where first we had just an M. Now we have mass ratios. Now we need to change all the masses uniformly, keep the mass ratios the same. That's not going to change this inequality. So in this case, you will still have, um, it, it will be symmetry, right? But you don't, yeah, it will be symmetry if you change all the masses. Uh, regardless of how you think about um, G, um, right? Because now the only constant that's left is the mass dimension. So there's not really a difference between inclusive and exclusive scaling, right? The original motivation to build, build G along was because it uh, looked a bit like a mass. Gamma doesn't. Uh, so there's, there's nothing for us to disagree about. Um, in this case, it's very clear. You change the masses, nothing will change. This is the symmetry of the theory. So how does it compare to standard Newtonian gravity? Well, it's empirically equivalent. Uh, you can still get all the, uh, we can talk about it in q and if you want. I'm just going to claim it for now. Um, but it's, I wouldn't say theoretically, uh, I wouldn't say it's theoretically equivalent to the standard version. First of all, the equations are distinct, um, but also uh, uh, the models are distinct in the sense that if you do have the absolute math, right? For all the models you have in this theory, uh, you have many, many, many models in the previous theory, namely the same one, except you add any any um, distribution of absolute masses compatible, consistent with uh, the models here, which only have mass ratio. Uh, so again, there's a many to one uh, relationship between uh, the models. So I would also say it's dimensionally distinct. Um, so theoretically inequivalent, but you now can get mass uh, scaling to be symmetry. That's what you are after. Um, conclusion. Um, if you look at this standard case of Newtonian uh, gravity, you're going to change the strength of gravity, uh, how to think of it. Well, uh, like in all cases, it's going to be inquiry equivalent. In the humanist case, um, well, it still describes the same mosaic. So in that sense, it's also theoretically equivalent, all the different options for uh, the curly G's. Um, uh, and in fact, if you go for the sophisticated route, you could also make it such that even at the supervenient level, it all just describes the same thing. Um, and then in the main case that I looked at, both in law case, I think the right way to think about scalings and about whether you change G is that a different theory or not. I think it is a different theory, so we shouldn't be chaling, uh, changing uh, G. Um, yeah, we shouldn't, we have different theories. Um, and if we don't change it, then also, uh, oh, sorry, if we don't scale G along, then mass scaling is another symmetry. And so we need to be really about absolute masses. Uh, but if you don't like that conclusion, you can go for this theory uh, for the Machian alternative. And I think then the conclusion does um, work that we should not be really about um, masses, but not because of the G issue, but just because these are different laws where it is actually a symmetry. Where you just use one function, right? If you just see this as a function, you don't use the function. Just if you scale the masses, you still get using the same function, get the same acceleration without having to handpick for a function every time you uh, change the masses to make sure nothing changes observationally. Uh, let me stop there. References? Oh, it's not hundred percent. Is there anyone ahead? Yeah, and I was wondering which of the uh, the Jacob Placer and the Shallow. Oh, did I get it wrong? I don't know. Oh, this is uh, read the to the nature of a comment. Thank you. That one, yes. Yeah, I knew that would be. Oh, did I? I thought it was the only. Published online, but not in the Okay. Yeah, that's right. It's okay. online. Like, nah, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's why. Okay. 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 It's that one. It's that one. Yes. Um, yeah. oh, this week I've been fighting with publishers about the case. I'm having the whole mindset. Sure. Yeah. I'm happy to call it fun, but it's that one. That's that paper. Yeah.
And um, uh, the Mahmoud Jala is the draft on Filsa Aka, which is not published yet. And the John T. Roberts thing is still the, the uh, 2016 draft on academia. Uh, well, Mahmoud's paper is forthcoming in Silicon Valley. Oh, good. Okay. Great. Um, nice. So, back onto the regular QA. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll go with Mike first. So, this was really interesting. I wonder how much of this rested on not just denying relationalism, but accepting criticism. So you said that you 